Okay, I have another one of those um, pieces of cardstock that I've just done some, uh, I don't know, background applications of color with. And uh, I did a video fairly recently that was um, entitled something like Something from Nothing, okay? And I do believe that um, this stamp line can <laughs> bring us through some, um, I don't know, tough kind of compositional situations and having something like this kind of already established is a tough assignment but I have faith in my stamps that they'll you know that they can be utilized in just about any situation and you can come out with some pretty good results so I have a couple of these swatches right here this one's a little bit more of a problem because I have a completely different color swatch here and I was testing out um, I don't remember what it was. It was uh, ground espresso. Okay, so I'll get to this one a little bit later, but this one actually has some um, Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White splattered here, too, so that's a little bit of an extra obstacle, but I can probably come up with some kind of ledge here. But the thing is, the fact of the matter is that thing's so solid right there, it might be a problem. Uh, so that'll be put to the test, and we'll see what we can come up with on that one. But this one right here, I think I can do something with. And I was, you know, you have to kind of look around on it. And, I don't know, it's like looking into a stone for a sculpture or something like that, a sculptor. And trying to imagine something within this space right here. Luckily, I've left a little bit of the white of the paper that will represent some light areas in here. But let's just see what we can come up with on this, okay? So I have to come up with something fairly bold on this because of all of that area that's filled in with kind of a universal value and uh, there's different colors up there as well there's you know different values of blue different intensities I guess that one's a little bit more violet of course but um, let's just see what we can come up with this is called meadow right here and it has a fairly strong um, tree line okay and I figured I would work that tree line right along here and then we can put some other things down here at the base and with that kind of swooshy you know kind of application of color I figure I can use that for I don't know maybe some kind of representation of wind but let's see just how it goes let's start off the one thing at a time here okay now this is a half page piece of paper too I don't know if it's makes this harder or easier because there's more space to work with but you know let's just go with this piece of paper I wasn't gonna cut it in ha uh, half or something like that I just wanted to utilize what already existed now these are just kind of swatches if I took like a pen you know and had like scribbles like this that might be a little bit harder I have to come up with something kind of more I don't know not abstract, but I don't know, just some kind of different take on something like that. Or I would just have to color things equal to, or a darker value than, you know, such scribbles. Okay, let me see if I, oh, this paper might be a little bit crooked or uneven from a... So I just cleaned off my desk today, so I don't know, I'm working in unfamiliar territory. Okay, so those are my meadows up there. Step down. It's really uneven looking right now, but you know, we'll just have to apply a lot of color into it. Okay. Now, um, let's add in some foreground grass. Okay, this is the grass texture stamp. And I mean, with all these blues already established in here, it, you know, it would just be better if I went with some sort of nighttime, you know, limited hue scheme. In other words, I'm not going to bring in too many different colors in here uh, because I can't. You know, everything's already kind of been established. So there's a couple of rocks down here. All right, that's the boulders with like and small and that grass texture. I want to kind of fill things in because there's all these little splotchy applications of things. So I'm adding some extra textures within this given space so that when I add some additional um, colors into it, it will 
kind of fit in with the different textures and um, uh, objects within that space so that it'll give me an excuse to have all these kind of different types of textures around in there. At least that's the concept. I don't know how this is going to work because I never work this way. Um, you know, and besides that one, you know, recent um, uh, video where I took, um, I don't even remember what I started with. I guess it was some kind of scratch paper with something on there. Okay, this is the Cloud Cumulus. All right, now I've used this a lot. This is one of my favorite stamps. It's a great filler stamp right here, and it can really fill in a lot of area, and it is textured itself, okay? So if you put texture over texture, as long as this texture is a little bit more dominant than what you see there, so I just went darker than those colors on there, it should, in theory, work out. We'll see how it goes. Sometimes these things will, are put to the test, you know, in terms of uh, the concept on how I want these to work. And they work just fine, but, you know, when you're doing something like this, you know, it really kind of puts them to the test. All right, so see, we'll have like that. Now, see, I, I blotted all around the perimeter so that it would blend in really nicely into those trees right there. Now, this is kind of a navy blue. Any kind of darker blue would look good. Now, I don't know if anyone's doing, like, a stamp along with me, because I don't... You're not going to do that swatchy thing in the background, I doubt, to start off with. But you could. You know, some people do um, things like braired backgrounds. Now, it's going to look a lot better than, you know, this card does at this time. You know, with that real splotchy kind of random application of colors. I was just doing that on this larger piece of paper because I wanted to see, um, you know, what these, uh, you know, all these different... Um, Reinkers look like I don't know a lot of those reinkers that I got recently and I have a video on that one You can see that um, I don't know from a few videos back But um, I bought a lot of reinkers and I don't actually have the pad for them Because I figured I didn't need it. I was just using them for their ink color. Okay. All right So here's four impressions going across there It looks really kind of symmetrical and not really that nice right now but we'll try to figure out something to, uh, I don't know, improve on the compositional structure and kind of what this um, piece will end up being or representing, you know, some staging for possibly some subject matter. And I'm starting to see things, some ideas starting to develop right now on what this scene could be. I'm seeing this area down here in the light. Maybe we can put a little figure down there could be a person, an animal, something of that sort. You can put a little cabin in there, something like that. Okay, here I'm kind of turning my cloud this way. And on this side, so I went one, two, three, four. This one I went like this. It's, it's really not great to go like a 90 degree angle, but that's almost at 90 degrees with my next impression. And this next one I went like that, so it is kind of 90 degrees, but just to show you that you can go pretty crazy with this cloud right here. Um, and, you know, it works great right there, and it's, it's working great for kind of eradicating uh, this mess of a kind of a, an established background already, okay? So what this is kind of looking like, hopefully, see, I have that little area of light up there, okay? So let's not go over that completely. And I'm trying to make it look like some light is coming through these clouds right here and shining down here, just, you know, because that's what I, you know, have to work with, so. All right, so anyways, we have that. So see, everything's kind of, you know, not exactly, but it's starting to kind of blend in a little bit. Maybe I should have brought this in here, too. Maybe I'll go for a third impression here. I'll see if I can get a little bit of blue in there. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so see that right there? I mean, it's really splotchy up there, and you know what I started off with, so... Um, you know, it's kind of coming around already. I, I think I can start to see, you know, what some of this will... I don't know if it's represent, but kind of what some of these parts will 
be established potentially as okay so we have light from here I usually don't like my light like right in the center but at least this is a little bit off center right here so maybe we'll put some additional branch or something coming around this way you know to I don't know kind of break it up into a little bit of a uh, we're, we're gonna try to crowbar in our rule of thirds type of thing into this as far as a compositional kind of format Okay, so let's see here. We have a pretty big piece of paper. Now we've already established a lot of the uh, the lighting in here, but let's start off. Now this is completely dry from um, all these colors that I've you know first established, but let's lay down some additional tone. This is just some tumbled glass. This is the dye-based ink right here, okay? It's the Distress Ink um, dye-based colors, okay? And I'm just sopping this up right here. This is why I didn't necessarily need a pad. Pads are really convenient, but, you know, I don't know. I, I bought a, you know, a, quite a few colors. I don't know, maybe not for, for a lot of you, but um, for me, I just figured, okay, I'm gonna buy twice as much ink without buying the pad, as I would if I bought the pad and the reinker, okay? Uh, because I hadn't been pad shopping in a lot, in a really long time, or ink shopping, I should say. Okay, so this is just kind of laying down some additional tone. You can't really see what I'm doing because this is a very light value of blue, okay? But I'm just kind of getting some of this paper kind of re-inked and established as far as um, dampness. It's not so much for this color that I'm working with right now, or this value more specifically. It's very light, light in value, but what I'm kind of doing is see I'm kind of laying this around in these areas. So it's kind of giving this a little bit of a kind of a, a moist foundation right here because when I work when I get into my darker tones I want these colors to the colors that I get to to really blend in very nicely okay if you go with a drier piece of paper right it's going to be more absorbent so if I go with a darker color and I'm coming into it you know and I do some kind of stroke like that we might see it because it will this is a prime example right here this is a complete matte paper right and that is not you know, you can't move it around because it's absorbed. Now this is this is a coated paper, so it's not going to be you know quite so absorbent. But anyways, that's the kind of concept is kind of you establish you know a bit of a kind of a foundation coat with your lighter colors. At least in this technique right here, I have a you know there's other ways you can use these stamps certainly, and some people never do this technique. Okay, but this one right here is a good way to kind of build up kind of a really thick, bright layer of colors, you know, that have been overlapped with each other when you're working with um, glossy cardstock, if you like that look. It's kind of like a postcardy look because glossy cardstock, coated cardstock, is um, the type of uh, cardstock that most postcards are printed on. So we're doing the exact same paper as professional printers in this technique right here. It's a different technique. They're using a usually a four or five color printing process, you know, but um, kind of this is a, a similar idea in terms of um, the layering of colors, okay? Transparent colors. All right, now this is um, a Caribbean blue. It's a little bit of a warm blue. I can still see this real kind of hard, um, splotchy look in the background, but the more that I kind of lay down, you know, colors over the top of it, it gets a little bit darker, especially where it's, you know, like right here, this little big blob of kind of that purplish tone. And the more that will kind of disappear, but I'm not kind of rushing to do that. I want to build up some colors underneath and layer them so that it's a nice, rich end result as opposed to a, you know, real solid version of a darker color, but that looks kind of flat because it doesn't have all these undercolors showing through those various layers, okay? 
So what I used to do, just doing a little bit of a recap here, but um, be whatever kind of brands of inks you use, you can do it in, you know, re-inker forms. You just, you just kind of lay them out from light to dark. Let's say I didn't have any pads, I can use light, medium, then dark. You just work it through those values. You can see this one right here. This is light, medium, and darker, right? And if you have some intermediate tones, then you can just add those in here. You don't have to be brand specific. See this color right here looks to be about, I don't know, about the same value as this, right? So you can use this in place of it or use it together with it. I can see this right here. And th th these companies are pretty good about, you know, indexing, you know, packaging their um, colors that, you know, are pretty close to uh, the representation of that color of ink. So this one would go somewhere in between, like right here, right? So mix and match, you know, don't get caught up in using all the same brands of things or something like that. I mean, you certainly could, but you don't have to do that. All right, I try to mix and match all the time. You saw me use the uh, that Distress Ink Tumbled Glass. I really think that's a fantastic blue. I really like this color right here, which is a Marvy light blue. It's very, very bright. Marvies are the, to me, I, I haven't seen any other company that matches the brightness of Marvy. In fact, the second one closest to it is probably half the intensity of Marvy. Not across every single color, but, you know, the vast majority of them. And it's not to say that I like everything super bright. I like it some colors to be kind of more mellow and dull. So I can use those in conjunction with the super bright ones. I don't want everything to look all super, you know, like day glow colors or, you know, like fluorescent blues and greens, you know, to represent grass or something like that. That's why it's nice to have kind of a range of both value and intensity when it comes to um, colors. So combinations are often a good way to go when you're doing um, whatever pieces you're doing. Because when you have kind of a, a wide range of those two categories, the potentially richer the end result can appear. Dark to light, dull to bright, okay? Wide range, you know which doesn't mean contrast, it could be in contrast, but those are just the two ends. You want everything in between as well. Okay, so that was my dark blue. Now see, right now, I mean, it's still a little blotchy out there. That's not really bothering me, you know? I mean, I'm going to try to blend it in for the sake of this video right here, you know, in terms of, um, you know, trying to eradicate kind of the weaknesses of my starting point, which was really hard, definitive applications of, I don't know, a random applications of color, okay? So, this is blue right here, it's pretty dark. I don't like this compositionally yet, but we'll add in some other foreground elements in here, though, so that is to come. You can't even, you can barely see me applying this, but that is kind of nice because I can go like this, see? And that just blends in perfectly fine and easy. There's no worries about color blending. Now here's what you have to do though. When you get into these darker tones, don't do that, you know, right in the lightest areas because those lightest areas have no ink, right? Or very little ink, like right in there. I can do this in the darker areas because there's so much ink around there, okay? So, when you get into your darker tones, just put on the brakes a little bit and don't go into your lighter areas with those colors. If you, if you de deem, oh, you know, and I should have used a little bit more color in there, or that's too anemic looking, go in with your lighter version of something like maybe, I don't know, this is like a nighttime scene here probably, right? Because it's all kind of this bluish tone, but maybe I want a little bit of a light green, but don't come into there with like a Christmas green or something like that. Come in with, with like a very pale, anemic light green or something like that first, okay? 
Does that make sense? Build things up from very light into your darker tones. And it makes the uh, kind of layering and blending process so much easier that way. And you have a lot of control over it, so try to achieve um, your full saturations with whatever ink you're working in at that moment. Okay. Kind of going pretty dark over here. I usually like to have a little bit more variation, but we're going with what we, you know, what, you know, we were given in this case, okay? Which is a really kind of nasty <laughs> foundation to, uh, to work with. Okay, Prussian blue. Prussian blue. Gosh, if you watch these videos, you must get tired of me saying the exact same thing over and over again. But Prussian blue is a really dark blue from Marvy. It's, it's one of the darkest blues, and it can really penetrate the ink that is kind of laying it on, on this paper right now. I don't know why. The viscosity is like a lot thinner for some reason. Kind of adding a little bit of shadows around these rocks in here. So I'm tilting my applicator to get a kind of a thinner application. Now see when I say that now I'm just thinking about clear snap is discontinuing to operate. I was about to say discontinuing these tools that are discontinuing their entire you know company so I don't know if these applicators will be available through another manufacturer or not. I still have some, and I put in a, a final order, so hopefully they can fulfill their final orders that they're going to imagine kind of in a panic purchasing uh, rush, you know. I would imagine they're kind of bombarded with orders for pads and whatnot, so... Uh, I'll find something else to work with, although these tips right here can really last a long time, but um, I do believe in making do and, you know, utilizing what we, we can get. But... I don't know. I believe in ingenuity and people are just kind of making do with what we can find. I love that kind of spirit. Okay, do you see this? It's starting to kind of mellow. I, I don't really see a clear indication of um, kind of my you know, uh, initial um, foundation that I was working in at this point in time. It, it seems to be kind of eradicated for the most part. Okay, let's go with the darker impression of this. Okay, do you see that where I, I stamped those clouds in the dark blue? So this cloud out here is the same color as this one out here in terms of the impression. It doesn't look like it though, does it? Because I've colored in this one more. But out here where I've used a lot of that same blue or a darker blue than the blue that I stamped this out in, um, you can't really see it as much, so what we can do is we can go back to our image here. And I'll just stamp it in a darker value now in those darker areas. I can, I can even do it in black if I want to. Okay, so out here, 
darker area. Let's do go with a darker impression and let's see if it transfers on there. Sometimes, even though I say that that Prussian blue can penetrate and whatnot, let's see how it does in, in an actual impression too. Yeah, it's a little bit darker. See right down here. See that's that dark blue. That one's the other one. It's a little bit lighter. I, I, I might have to go to black though. It might be too light, or the ink just didn't have a chance to transfer over because the area down here is like sopping wet with ink. It's not wet to the touch, but the pulp of the paper is getting fairly moist from the uh, just the sheer level of um, ink layering that I'm laying down here. I usually do use a lot of ink anyway, but um, I'm, I'm probably using a little bit more just, you know, for the very nature of that kind of foundation that I was working in. Okay, so you see that right there? That's the Prussian. I think it stands out a little bit more. You can see that down here there was, you know, if, well, you can, if you compare that impression, that one, it's a little bit darker, isn't it? So see, it's going from kind of lighter in here and darker out here with the colors that I've applied, right? I've applied the lighter colors to here, medium tones went to about right here, so darker colors are out here. But you can also do that in the images too. You go with one, you know, value of the impression and you go with the darker ones and the darker areas. It's kind of hard to tell which ones you should go with, kind of until you start laying the inks down. Like if I, if I stopped at a lighter, value of blue, then the, this Prussian blue would really stand, stood out over there in the corner. So you just you, know, you kind of have to let things develop, you know, and see where things go, how dark things get, and you start doing your colors. So it's not, you know, a lot of people do kind of this process of a certain process, which is fine, and that's kind of you stamp things out, and then you tone them in, you color them in, right? And then, I don't know, we do special effects, or I don't know, whatever you might be doing, okay? But at no point in time can you not, you know, stamp out other types of images. It could be more of a little bit more of a circular process. You can stamp, color, stamp, color, you know. I don't know if that's a circular process, but one that's kind of oscillating back and forth, too. Just depending on what's happening within your scene so you're kind of responding to it and not being you know held to a certain type of uh, process okay so here's some black around the edges there see that that led, had a little bit more depth and I don't like that as is so what I'll do is I'll bring in some black and kind of blend that in a little bit more. Okay, so here we go. All right, I'm actually cleaning my stamps off here. I have my cleaning pad because I I should really keep my area clean for at, at least a one day. <laughs> <laughs> or one scene. You know what I'm talking about, too. Um, you know, when we clean our space and then we, uh, you know, sit down and do one project. And our desk looks like, you know, like it did, you know, before we started cleaning after doing one, you know, one card or something like that. Okay, so this is just kind of blending that on a little bit more. And I'm going in with the black. Since I stamped out objects in black, I believe that using that same color, or whatever your darkest color is, going in and blending in with that same tone, kind of brings everything together. doing that thing around the shadows down in these rocks here where I'm tilting the applicator before I went on my tangent on a clear snap what I was getting at is um 
you know, this tool like this is really nice to be able to kind of utilize in its entirety, use it on its side. It's very comfortable in the hand. It's like holding a pen, you know, you hold it like you use a pencil or something like that. You can use it, you know, very delicately like this with a kind of a drier bit of ink on it. And these types of tools were meant to be used in a certain way because they're they're made for, you know, like handles, then they're made for wet media, okay? I do like other types of uh, applications too, and it goes back to that spirit of kind of utilizing things and making do or creating new uses for existing things. And what I'm getting at is things like makeup brushes. I love them in terms of, um, and I love that people are using them too, and they're very inexpensive. Um, but makeup wedges or something like that, they're not really made for like wet medium media, but you can use it that way, but it's just not ideal for it. They're used for kind of dry media, right? You're not putting slathered applications of a, like wet, you know, water-based things on, you know, someone's foundation or something like that. But, um... I do like them though for the uh, the variety that they can bring into a given scene or you know whatever you're doing a given card or whatnot like right here like I really love I'll use it in here I haven't used mine for a while because I've been doing these quick cards and I've been trying to uh, just do things very quickly without getting into other types of applicators and media that will extend the process. But I'll show you what I love those for in a minute. Okay, but see that this is doing, I'm kind of putting a little bit of shadow right at the base of all of my objects in here. So it kind of anchors them to the scene. You know, you're saying that that object um, has an opacity to it. In other words, they're casting shadows, but they also have a visual weight to them. See that line in the background like that, just underneath my trees? Okay. I like my kind of area a little bit more kind of irregular, so that's why I like putting these kind of streaks into it like so. Doesn't it kind of have a kind of hazier look? Plus it's helping me to again get rid of kind of that, kind of obliterate that, I don't know, that foundation of, uh, you know, swatches that were down there. Okay, but this, this tool works just fine for this, what I'm doing right here, but you know, these types of uh, tools like this are really great, too, for, you get that in there like that, and this is a really fantastic, very light application, you know, where you can really lay down a very delicate application of whatever color you're doing this with. This one just happens to be one of the darker colors. And one of the things, too, about, like, a sponge applicator, so sometimes when you're dabbing this down, or if you're dragging it, when this page gets pretty wet, and they do get pretty saturated with ink if you use as much as I do, um, sometimes when you're doing a swatch like that or a swipe, you're almost removing ink because it's so wet in the pulp of the paper, it's reach, achieved kind of a super saturation. So doing something like this, you're building up these little micro applications of ink on your paper, okay? So it's just hitting it like that as opposed to kind of wiping it up. And it's this type of hair, this acrylic, you know, this um, hair or whatever, this plasticine type of uh, hair. These, these aren't natural hairs, I take it. Um, they're just transferring the ink off of it. So there's no absorption. So I can really get a nice kind of vignette like this right here. I can go really dark, and I can go really quite delicate, too. Now, I wouldn't want to do this for all those blues. This, like here, doing that like that, 
I mean, you can do kind of a swirly thing too, but it just doesn't build up as much like that because you, again, you get that wipe off type of uh, process like that. Not maybe not on a matte, you know, card paper, but on a glossy card stock it does after several layers. But this really gives me a really great um, buildup of ink for that nice strong silhouette or vignette, I should say. Okay, so there we go with that. We kind of have a nice stage for kind of whatever subject matter we might want to put in here. So, staging, dramatic lighting, and whatnot, what I always say is um, it's kind of fun to uh, kind of create stage, staging in here for whatever subject matter we want to uh, place within this given space, and that'll give, you know, brings a lot of drama into the scene. Okay, now, so now, I didn't pull out a bunch of other stamps because I had no idea what this was going to look like. I mean, I had kind of an idea a very general idea, but looking at it now, I'm thinking about some taller spaces. I don't like how this is like 50-50 right here, okay? I need some objects to kind of come in here in the foreground just to kind of break up this, you know, super monotonous, you know, um, space right here. So let me go grab some stamps and I'll try to figure out some things that'll work. I, I want some things with some height in here. I think I might want to go with some textures and whatnot. And we'll try to find something that'll work right in here. Um, so let me do that right now and I shall be right back. Okay, I think I found some uh, pretty good solutions for this piece. I'm going to add in some different trees into this. Um, landscape and we'll do them in a couple different types of ink okay we'll do them in uh okay i was going to do this in black in the background in a black dye base but i think i'll use that prussian blue i think the prussian blue will stand out against that background just fine and when you do um, when you utilize value within a given space. You can create um, depth and atmosphere that way. You know, when you have kind of darker objects and lighter objects, you're saying that those objects kind of in the distance are um, farther away because they're lighter. And, you know, objects, you know, light hits something in the distance and it's coming back to your eye, but it's being broken up, you know, that light is being broken up with all the uh, different atmospheric things, you know, dust and moisture in the air and whatnot. So things that are farther away are thus lighter in value. Okay, so I'm just adding these trees. They're going to be fairly subtle, but I think I just want to I want to introduce that because I'm going to be doing um, a darker version of a bare tree in the foreground. And so this is kind of going in, or it is, not kind of, but it'll be a reiteration of a similar shape within a scene, but much farther back in the distance, okay? So then I kind of grouped them a little bit. There's a much bigger one over there. It kind of disappears. Okay, so we have those little ones back there. Maybe we can go for one more. Okay, I'm not masking off the trees. I'm just kind of masking the rocks. The trees are black, so putting uh, dark blue over black, it'll still that black will still look as though it's closer to us just because it is darker. Okay, so there's a few little, so they're really subtle. I don't know, it's one of those little micro kind of details that, you know, I don't know if we needed, but I'm trying to make a, I don't know, what do they say it? Uh, what's that saying? Pearls or, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> we want to make this scene look really good, you know because of what we started off with, especially. Okay, 
All right, now. I'm trying to figure out where this... I don't want this to go right over that tree right there because it's so dark, so I'm trying to position this where I'm not obscuring everything out completely. Okay, let's hold on that one too because I was thinking... One of the things I was thinking about when I was looking at this is I, I think I can use a little bit more warmth in there. And I think I have the perfect color for that, if I could find it here. And that is the peeled pink. Um, green. Right. Real earthy green. Kind of an aged green is all the uh, distress ink colors are kind of based around. Why is that black there? I might have tapped some black in there from uh, a previous uh, scene. Okay. All right, there we go. That's much cleaner. Okay, so... <laughs> I'm going on with a different hue and temperature. Let me blot some of this off. Okay, so I'm not putting in anything too intense right immediately, so I can kind of get a gauge it. All right. And in fact, that's even a little bit too uh, bright there. I want something a little bit more dull. Okay, something like that. I'll bring this in a couple different areas just so it's not so isolated. Okay, so I've just put a little bit of temperature, or I don't know, it's quite a bit, it really stands out here. But I don't know, it kind of it kind of creates a nice mood there. I'll put some of this back here in the green, I mean over the blue, making it a little bit more turquoise. Again, so it's not just so isolated a, a color in that one area. Okay, something like that. All right. There we go. And I'll show you what I'm going to do in there. Coming up shortly. Okay. Or should I do it now? Well, let's go ahead and do, go with that foreground. Okay. Going back to this here. I... Things, I usually don't take so long, with, you know, in terms of my um, object placement, but I'm, it's just that I was working around that, kind of those given parameters, so I went really dark in some of these areas just to kind of really obscure kind of what was happening on the, on the paper <laughs> before I even started the scene or before I even thought to use it. That was just a piece of paper that I would normally toss out, but I thought doing this type of lesson, you know, is a pretty good example of, um, you know, kind of just going with whatever exists, and it can be something really quite extreme and uh, kind of horrific looking. I mean, this one really looks, really looks crazy. But just kind of staying with it. It doesn't mean that through this entire process, you know, when I'm doing cards, I, I definitely have faith that something's going to come out. I just, I'm just trying to concentrate in the moment. So, but sometimes I'm thinking ahead, you know, I'm human. I'm thinking like anyone, and thinking, my guy, you know, I don't know if this is going to come out, you know. There's always that kind of question, but I, I do have faith <laughs> that by the time I get to the end results and I'm putting in these foreground stamps, everything kind of comes together, and it, it almost always does. I can't remember a time when it really didn't, you know, as long as I stuck with it and worked with it. Um, I don't know. It just always comes about. And it might mean taking things and just going darker and darker and darker, you know. If I don't really like some, I didn't like that big old swatch that was down there in the corner, uh, for sure, you know. That was a real kind of obstruction. But, um, you know, I just so I just darken it up a little bit. You can kind of obscure things a little, a little bit, or you can direct your eye to go where you want your viewer's eye to go and kind of um, 
Um, uh, I don't know what it was. It? Kind of lessen the area's weak points by kind of, you know, bringing your viewer's eye around into an area that you do want them to see. I don't know if that didn't come out smoothly, but uh, I hope you get the point, you know. Kind of obscuring some things, okay? So like right now I'm putting these, say for example, I'm putting these foreground trees in here, and they're fairly solid, okay? So that whole area down there that I didn't like, you know, that was a real problem, you just put something right, right over the top of it, and it makes complete sense in a in a scenic stamping thing to have foreground, so, you know, even if it wasn't down there, you know, some kind of real ugly area to start off with, you know, would it stop you from, you know, would you not put foreground in there? No, you probably still would anyways, but it just comes to show you that it just doesn't matter, you know, these areas or whatever, just as long as you kind of work with it and uh, kind of build them up. Okay, now I've used those, um, that leafless pine image in the background. Now let's put this really tall one here in the foreground, okay? Because I still have that, kind of that issue in here about this horizon line being so, um, even, you know, in terms of like 50%, you know, that you've heard of a rule of thirds. Well, this is right like halfway up. I put it there because, uh, you know, what do I have starting off with too? Okay, so I'm going pretty tall. So see, I'm coming up through there and I'm going to break up this real definitive line. It's still going to be there, but you just don't make it, you know, it won't be quite as, quite as obvious, hopefully, because you're bringing this other element right through it, and that horizon line won't be so long. It's kind of broken up. Your mind will kind of, you know, put it together that it's certainly an object, but um, maybe not quite so prominent. Okay, this is versifying, by the way, if I didn't mention that. This is a really dark black ink. It's a pigment ink, so it really sits on the surface nicely. And it gives us a, a really beautiful foreground if you're going for, you know, things dark in the foreground. Things in the foreground often work really dark. The only time I don't do this is, let's say, I have a really dark background or something like that. And it's like a wintertime scene, so these are fun to stamp out in like a, a white pigment ink over the top of a dark blue background like it's um, kind of covered in ice or something of that sort, snow, ice, whatever. It's, it looks like a frozen um, object in the foreground. Would it look like that in nature? No, but um, it's certainly kind of a nice decorative element in terms of a, you know, stamped piece of, you know, art or whatever. Okay, so we have our objects in there. And I talked about this kind of area in here. Now let's see if I still have space for my um, figure that I picked out for that area. Okay. I think this little writer here, apparently I didn't. I probably grabbed this at a show and I just kind of put, I didn't have it in my demo kit, but. You should always kind of trim pretty close, just so that um, there's no chance of you kind of over stamping. Okay, just don't cut into the image, okay? All right, so we have this little writer, and I thought she would be perfect in that area if I can get her, get her to fit in that little given space. All right. These are my blocks covered with tack and peel. Tack apostrophe N peel. Gosh, they're right in my mind. I was thinking, okay, that's Sukuneka. That's not Claire Snap that makes that, so. Okay, so there she is right there. Okay. That almost looks black. That's my 
Prussian blue. It's so dark. Okay, now I'm not going to do this one in uh, the Versify, and I think I'm going to do it in the Marby, just so it's a little bit lighter, because she's farther away. I'm wiping off her feet a little bit, too. Well, not hers, the, the, the horse's feet, okay, so that they don't stamp out quite so dark. And I want it to, well, I guess I can go a little bit darker. Let me take off a little bit less. Down there I don't have too much grass texture, so I'm just going to wipe out the bottom a little bit so that it looks like the, you know, the horse is kind of walking in the grass. Alright, so go like this. Okay. So that kind of dynamic between light source and a reflected light. It's just a really narrow kind of spotlight down there. But doesn't that kind of create a strong um, dynamic right there? Now I've left an opening here too, you know, so we could see in there because I know I was going to stamp something in there so I didn't you know, stamp a bunch of trees in the, you know, right in here. If I stamped a bunch of trees right in here where it, nothing was showing, I, I would probably bring something like some birds or something like that flying up into the sky right in there. But the fact that we had some, a little bit of light area down here still, you know, that was what I was given with the, uh, the, uh, that background, that scratch paper, you know, there was a little bit of light area down here and light up there. So I just retained those two spaces right here. And this is what I've talked about too in other videos um, quite often. It's this dynamic of lighting, easy scenic lighting, okay? You don't have to kind of, uh, you don't have to overanalyze it. I mean, you could get more complex, and this is a really simplified version, but I usually have an area of light up here, okay? And there's usually an area of light down here. This time, I've just narrowed it, and I've, it's over here. So instead of it being right here, it's just shifted right there. And you can have it anywhere you want. You can have two pieces right here. But anyways, what we have is light, and then there's dark, and there's light right down here. Instead of it being one hole, see there's this area in between. So you've created this light source and reflected light dynamic. Doesn't matter if it's coming off of a cabin or a body of water, an ocean or something like that. Sometimes instead of just one area, it's kind of bisected. So you have this area that's light, dark, light, dark, light, or something like that, okay? But for the most part, it's just two different areas. You can just bisect this one up as much as you want. Not on here, because I have this tiny quarter-sized little thing right here, but that's your scenic lighting. In other words, people that have a hard time with it, they see this area sky, so they color it in all blue, so it's all that is in here too. Or this area that's green, they color in that whole thing. They don't leave some lighter areas within the space, okay? It doesn't have to be white, you know, but it just has to be lighter. So, you know, if it's that color over here, we're not going to have that reflected light dynamic, you know, which not every scene has to have or anything like that, okay? But that's your lighting in there, okay? It just It's just the retention of um, kind of some lighter areas, and, you know, it doesn't always have to be white either, okay? Um, all right, so... I'm going to flip this around like this so I can get into this area right here, but um, I am going to use some of this pigment ink right here. And you want this kind of cotton swab to be kind of unwound a little bit. Don't take off everything, but see here's this still, this is still padded and bouncy, okay? You don't want to be jabbing in and hitting the stick on your paper. If you're hitting the stick, that means, see, I'm, as I'm kind of pulling this, I'm kind of pulling it up too, okay, and kind of unraveling it a little bit. Now, this has been sitting on my desk for a while, so it seems like it's a little bit looser anyways. But when it's a little bit tighter, you just kind of pull it off a little bit like this. I'm pulling it up this way a little bit and then making it soft, okay? See, I'm kind of smashing it down a little bit. Someone asked about this, and I know what they're talking about, too, because I get it, too, if I'm not careful. And they were hitting the stick part of this, you know, which means they haven't raveled it too much, and then they're hitting it too hard, okay? So see, it's right here. This is about, this is perfect right here. 
if you want a soft application, we want a soft applicator, right? Not the hardness of the stick. Okay, so right here, I'm just lightly dabbing it in. Okay, getting a pretty good coverage of it. Okay, now watch this here too. I have this blank piece, black piece of paper, so you can see what's kind of going on here. Now there's a lot of ink on this, okay, so it's, see that kind of blob right there? A little bit too close to focus in, but here. Watch if I do that hard, it's still a blob, right? But see this lighter touch right here? Watch this right here, see that? Watch this with one tap. Barely anything, right? That's what you want to do, but see here's what I'm doing. One tap left that, but you know, 10 or 12 taps leaves that, leaves that, right? You don't want to get that with one tap because that means you wouldn't like that, okay? And they really smashed it down. So it's just like this little bit. Imagine you're applying makeup to, you know, it's Halloween and it's a child's face that you're applying their makeup onto, okay? And you put it on their eye or something like that, or above their eye, okay? Not on their eyeball but over their eye or something like that. That's about the touch you want, okay? So this area right in here, I just want to kind of give it a certain lightness. Now see, I put a lot on there because I'm going in the lightest areas. I really want that to be kind of uh, lightened up quite a bit. So this is one of those instances in kind of just rubber stamping in general, you know, it doesn't have to be scenic stamping, where you can kind of add light back into dark. And you can do it in a very soft manner and controlled manner, where you can lighten it up to a certain degree and not just have it a certain value. You can make it look lighter and lighter and lighter the more you apply with this, okay? Now see, this is where the light is coming out, right within that space, so... Maybe I want that area to be the lightest. It's kind of hard to get really light though with pigment ink. Maybe Brilliance, that specific brand that dries really fast. But this ink is a, little, a lot more translucent than opaque, okay? If I stamp something out in like a black matte paper, it might look pretty light, but still you're gonna get some of that black usually showing through, at least with all the uh, different um, pigment inks that I've tried. I haven't really come across one that's really opaque. But that works to our advantage because we can really control the amount that we apply and how it looks, okay? All right, so let's come in here a little bit more. See that? It's really blobby right there. But what I'll do is I'll just kind of take this. Now, nah, actually, that's too much. I went extreme. This pad that I'm working with is really... Uh, um, Quite new, relatively speaking. I can never see. I just switched it around to my side that wasn't uh, didn't have ink on it, and I'm just tapping, and that tapping is removing some ink. So this one that has a lot of ink is applying. Let me go a little bit lighter. Okay, when I move into the darker areas. Okay. And the ultimate tool for this type of process, just tapping your finger down there if you need to remove some. So it kind of looks a little bit softer around some of these clouds too. It looks really great where dark meets light, or light meets dark. So I start in the lighter areas, then I just kind of move it into those darker areas slowly. It doesn't stand out in the lighter areas. You know, white on light doesn't really stand out too much. So you start it in there, and then you kind of move it out there. You know, the drier it gets on this tip right here, the less you see of it, so that's when you can move it into your darker areas, okay? All right, so we get something like that. 
You can see what it looks like. See that? That's what it, <laughs> that's exactly. You can see where it, it, it's been applied, but it looks like that. See that right there? Got the perfect light to show you where it's been applied. It just kind of makes the clouds look a little bit softer. And this is, again, I, I don't do this for my, like my quick scenes. Maybe I do a little bit of an application with it, but I do like that kind of softer look up there. So look at how dramatic that looks. Okay, now let me see. This horse is looking, it's a little bit wet, but okay. No time like the present. Not really. I mean, we could wait till it dries a little bit, but we'll take some of this ink application that we've been doing up here and let's bring it down here a little bit into this area if there's a little bit of fog down there we would see it be careful not to go over your pigment ink because that's still drying if you've used that see if there's if there's some fog showing anywhere in the scene it would be where the light is hitting it right because fog, this little mist down here, means that it's moisture in the air and it's being illuminated by the light. So if this area over here is not lit, you wouldn't see that illumination of moisture within the air. So again, I kind of put it where light meets dark, okay? So here is light. You know, I move it up into that little darker area ever so slightly. It's kind of a, I'm starting to lose my tip here. You know, eventually you have to kind of switch off and get to a new soft tip. Okay, there we go. Otherwise it, gets, it starts getting a little blotchy on me. Sometimes I, I don't feel like changing tips because I'm almost done, but uh, I don't know. I kind of have to keep just working with it then. <laughs> it, looks, it doesn't, you know, it looks a little blotchy. It's easier to do with a softer tip. Maybe I should look into some uh, other different types of cosmetic brushes for this uh, touch. I, I saw some really good candidates for it uh, looking on uh, the other day. You know, after I was kind of thinking, okay, let's see, we should have some alternatives for them um, for uh, Colorbox stylus tools, just in case people, I don't know, we need to switch up before too long. Okay, kind of adding some more of this down here. This dries darker than how it looks after you apply it, okay? Then tomorrow this, it won't look nearly as white, okay? It dries dark, which means you can put another layer on there too if you want to. Or you can just kind of go a little bit more than what you think looks best um, right after applying. And if you apply too much and you don't like how it looks in certain areas, how they looked, you know, the next day or whatever, you can remove some of it or you can move all of it. You just take a paper towel and you just wipe it right off. Which means that if you want it on there and you mail it to someone, you should probably spray seal it just, you know, to protect it a little bit too fix it, you know, down so you can use a spray fixative or a workable fixative or a Krylon Crystal Clear or something of that sort just to coat it and protect your work a little bit more. It'll increase the saturations of your colors as well too, so it'll make it look uh, even better. Okay, look at that light coming through. It doesn't look, look uh, heavenly. <laughs> I don't know. It's like that light coming through the, uh, the clouds like that. And, Here's this rider out here going for a you know, midnight ride. Maybe she couldn't sleep or something like that, or maybe she just it relaxes her. You know, there's, there's some things that are on her mind. Nothing, you know, kind of uh, makes her feel more at peace than taking her horse out on the property or acreage or whatever. White paint, uh, white gel pen. I still say white paint pen after kind of a 
probably I don't know, 15 or 20 years of uh, really not using them much anymore, if at all. Before gel pens were out, um, and I used the white ones especially, um, I used to use paint pens. Sakura had one, and uh, God, there was this other one, I don't even remember the name. But it was more along those lines of those pens that are still out there in the metallics, and I believe those white paint pens are still out there too. Um, they, the types that have that little ball bearing in there, so when you shake it, it's really shaking things up inside the pen. But anyways, I'm adding in these little highlights down here. Maybe those are wildflowers that she's kind of writing through. Okay. And I think it's just kind of a, it adds a little bit of kind of this whimsical, whimsy, or kind of magic into the scene. So this is like little pearly everlasting or something like that, being illuminated by the uh, by that moonlight I'm guessing coming through the clouds. Okay, but let's take a look too at some of these rocks. Okay, the lighting is coming from above. So see these rocks here? In the designs themselves, I have created these rocks to be lighter on the top side surfaces of them. So in shading, I shade the bottom part of it, but on highlighting, I put a few little dots on the top and it makes them seem more rounded. So you put shadow at the base. Okay, as you can see, I've drawn them right here. These have been rendered with shadows at the base of the rock. So with my stylus tool, I've kind of gone in here and I put those little streaks of color down here. Okay, darker streaks have kind of gone like right along in there like that. Okay. But on the top sides of them, see how they're lit like that? You put a few little highlights on the top, so you go dark on the bottom, light on the top. Does that make sense? And that makes these rocks seem a little bit more dimensional. See those um, little highlights on the top like that? So you hold it out like that, and you have this kind of more three-dimensional looking object. Everything's two-dimensional on here, of course. But visually, it can look a little bit more three-dimensional. The darker a rock is, like it's in the shadows, you just don't use as many dots, or if any at all, because you're seeing that light isn't hitting in those areas, okay? But you see how that kind of brings those little rocks to life a little bit, see that like that? See those rocks I left a little bit lighter, so I didn't darken them. I put a medium tone on there, but if you will few little highlights on it like that. See those little dots down here. You can use blue, whatever colors you want to. You can do it on the same on some of these boulders right here. Kind of more of the foreground boulder. Okay. Now watch this here too. Okay. Highlighting, okay? Where's my light in here in relation to this tree? It's off to the left side, right? So, let's go into these left side trees. Now this is in a lot of darkness. You can barely see it. You can only see it because it's kind of done in that uh, uh, versifying black. If it was the dye-based ink, it wouldn't be showing up quite as much, but see, so if it's just barely in there, you, it's really, very visible. I'm putting a few little highlights on the left side of the tree, okay? See see that right there? And see the light is coming from over there. And we can put a few little highlights on the left-hand side of all these trees, okay? I mean, you don't have to be so, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't have a dot on the, the right side. I'm just kind of, you know, 
adding a little bit extra like that. Okay, now what about these trees over here? These trees are right side lit, right? So I'm flipping this around so I can get at some of these areas right here. So I will put some of these highlights on the side of this tree. On the side that is facing that light. And it's just a little bit of fun. I'm going to put some on some of these branches just so it's not all completely dominant, you know. Notice there's some trees that are kind of right underneath it, so wherever you put it, it doesn't matter too much. Put it on both sides, okay? But a few little dots, you know, here and there, and you are a lighting expert. Okay. See these trees right here? Does this kind of stand out a little bit more from a three-dimensional aspect? Okay. I don't like this area right here. I'm going to come in with some extra grass down in here, okay? Yeah, maybe maybe that's too big. Maybe I'll come in with a smaller one. This is my reeds stamp right here. I just want some of this grass down here. I'm adding a few more impressions than I thought I would, but anyways. So that little extra grass down here. Does that kind of complete that little area down there a little bit more? By having that grass right here. Okay, so... Where is the light coming from? In the clouds right here. Okay, so when the clouds are over the top of the light source, they would be bottom lit, right? So here's a few little dots right in here. As it moves farther away, you just use less dots because you're saying that light isn't hitting that area as much, so. A few little highlights right in here. Okay. And the clouds underneath the light are being top lit, so you can put a few little highlights on those. Is that right there? It looks kind of weird when you look at it really close. But this is kind of viewing it from arm's distance. It's a lot more subtle. Like you can see those little highlights on those trees, right? But it doesn't look like, you know, like that, you know, when you look at it at, you know, standard viewing distance. Okay, so I think that is it. And, I don't know, you can tell me, you know. Uh... You know, did we take kind of something, I don't know if it's something from nothing, but it's, I think it's something from, something from, I don't know, ugly, or whatever, you know, that piece of, uh, it's like, for, you know, something from a mess, you know, in terms of kind of a starting foundation, I would never want to start that way, you know, um, and be forced to work in a certain area, you know, make certain areas really dark just to kind of completely obscure it, you know. I'd rather that kind of be my choice, but it's not bad, you know. Uh, it's not a bad way to uh, kind of play around once in a while to really kind of test your, um, I don't know, your interpretive skills in terms of um, kind of where you can take something. You know, you be forced to do a composition that... Um, you, you, where you're working around kind of some limitations and, uh, I don't know, seeing what you can come up with, but I don't know, this, 
to me, I mean, it doesn't have too many things that are different than what I normally go for. The one thing that I didn't like, though, was just how symmetrical this was. 50-50 right here with this long kind of horizon line. It just... It, it looks weird to me. So what I've done is I've broken that up. You have some things in the foreground that go right through them so you don't have this super long line that goes from edge to edge. You break it up a little bit. Your mind fills it in. And I know that, you know, this, you know, tree line is the same tree line over here after it gets broken up right here, but it's not quite so obvious. And then we have kind of this diagonal dynamic right here. In terms of this um, figurine in here, I think it looked strange kind of as a compositional element without having something right down in there, don't you think? I mean, we remove that figure right here, and it, it's missing something. It would have had to, like I said, some birds up in here or something like that would be kind of interesting, or, you know, something flying across the scene. But um, having that down there really kind of creates that, um, you know, that spotlight, spotlit dynamic, maybe. And I've, I've done other videos on that, how to, you know, spotlighting your uh, subject matters and whatnot. And this one really looks like a hard spotlight because of this area of light right here is so small and that it kind of matches up with that area right there. On here we have this kind of more expansive kind of um, um, gradation in terms of uh, value, but uh, right here it's much more condensed. But in here, you're talking about kind of vapor and moisture in the air in the form of clouds, much more reflective and whatnot than, you know, the grass of the, uh, the earth down here, the surface that's uh, a lot less reflective. So maybe it would account for this kind of darker uh, area down here. But anyways, the, you know, the only thing that matters is if it looks okay. And I think it looks, of course, much better than um, that throwaway nothing piece of uh, paper that we kind of started off with so okay so i don't know for lack of a better description right now we'll call it something from nothing and i hope that's a another kind of example of um kind of ways you can um just utilize whatever you you're given even if you are doing you know some sort of piece and whatnot if you don't like it then it's obscure it with some values, maybe place some things over the top of it. And just doing that, I mean, it really, really kind of completely, in this case, uh, remedied that certain area down here that was a problem um, in terms of what existed. Okay, so if you're going along with the scene that you've been stamping out, you know, darken in your perimeters around here, and it'll focus the attention more on areas that you like, or if you, you know, um, place objects in front of it, highlights, whatever, you know, those types of things, those types of things stand out in this and no longer does those kind of blotchy, you know, kind of swatches that were everywhere throughout the scene. So, okay. Anyways, stick with your scenes, play around with them. Don't throw any of, any of them away. Uh, if you get into a, a jam or whatnot, send them to me and I'll see what I can do with them. No one ever does that, but I think it'd be fun to do. Um, and just, uh, I can show you some remedies and whatnot, to, you know, that you can do on your, uh, I don't know, mistakes. Or you can just follow, kind of follow this lesson and just kind of keep working with it and see what comes out. Sometimes the best scenes that you'll come up with are the ones that you had to kind of really, you know, apply yourself and try to figure out solutions. You come up with the best techniques that way sometimes, or new ones at least and how to um, remedy a certain situation to get a scene looking uh, kind of acceptable in the end result, if not even better than you originally um, had hoped for. Okay, thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you like this video, hope you like and subscribe.